Hello and welcome to episode 135 of the Player 3 Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Croft. Alongside me, we have the always visually stunning Larry Hunt. Hi. We have a great show lined up for you today. Uh, We're going to talk about Fortnite coming to a surprising platform. Uh, Call of Duty gets a surprising release date. And Nintendo Direct ends with a surprise. Lots of surprises today, Larry. Is it Christmas? We had a surprising snowstorm. Uh, It is Christmas. It's just, uh, it's not Christmas. Not for another nine months. But uh, how are you doing today, my friend? I am great. I don't know how I'm going to make it home in this horrible snowstorm. Yes, you ventured the uh, 40-degree snow (laughs) weather. Yeah. It didn't quite get up to 40 like it said it was going to. And the roads are a little slushy, but in in Virginia, people just freak out. Yep. So, uh, I told you this already, but I'll say it on the podcast too. So, I was uh, driving to the bank this morning. And uh, did you set your coffee on the dash? Set my coffee on the dash. <laughs> Kicking it old school, Larry. Uh, anyway, so uh, a little bit of snow on the roads is starting to cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, this lady had somehow in her giant SUV, like a suburban, like I'm talking third row seating, all right? All right. Slides off the road, hits a light pole, and knocks an entire string of traffic lights over with literally just a dusting of snow on the roads. And I'm like, this is Virginia snow driving right here. People don't understand. Don't brake. <laughs> you know? Don't ride your brakes and you'll be okay. See, I with as little snow as we got, I have a hard time even imagining that she slid. Like, I, I like to think she just panicked and just floored it straight into a phone pole. <laughs> it's more feasible. She saw one snowflake and she's like, oh my gosh, I gotta turn around! I gotta turn around! Oh, um, <laughs> Anyway, we are on the Player 3 Podcast. We get together every Monday over here on twitch.tv slash Player 3 Podcast talk about video games. Push it out to you on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, all those places. Also, YouTube.com slash Player 3 Podcast. Go ahead, subscribe. Leave a little comment, a rating, a review. Uh, And if you're not American, our time has shifted by an hour, thanks to Woodrow Wilson. Oh, yeah. So for our European friends, we are four hours ahead for like Zephyr and them Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. for the next two weeks. And then it'll go right back to five. Their time changes in two weeks. I didn't know that, actually. Yes. I thought we were the only ones who did that. Nope. Uh, So, keep that in mind. Um, I'm realizing now I have everything out of order on these show notes right here. Excellent. (laughs) But that's okay. We can can do it on the fly. So, let's get this week started like we get every week started with, what have you been consuming? I always forget this. I'm like amped up for releases of the week and then... What have I been consuming? All yeah. right, I'll tell you what I've been consuming. Like we've been doing this for months. I know. <laughs> Maybe over a year now. Anyway, uh, I uh, we finished Star Wars Rebels. The last episode premiered last week, and uh, it was good. Good, satisfying ending. Uh, it's kind of like the Clone Wars in the sense that uh, it is this children's show, but it does it venture into being good for the older audience as well. So if you got kids, like it's a great show to watch with them. So where does Rebels fall in the timeline again? Uh, it's after three, but before four. Um, okay. So, I believe Luke Skywalker would be a teenager at this point. Okay, but still undiscovered. Yeah. They actually, there's an episode where they uh, go and counter uh, Obi-Wan, and it is a great episode. So, Maul survived, Darth Maul survives. Uh, right. He's got, like, uh, spider legs. Yeah. Then he gets some regular legs back. Oh. But he shows up again in Star Wars Rebels. and tries Like, just live Obi-Wan. your truth, Darth Maul. Like... <laughs> If you think you're a spider, just live as a spider. Like, don't don't let the norms of society pull you into some sort of conformist reality. I don't think you wanted to be a spider. I think the spider legs were a desperation move. Oh, okay. Because it's so much easier to make four legs rather than just two. Yeah. Was it four legs? How many legs did he have? I don't know. I think he had the full eight going on. Oh, man. He was real creepy at that stage. Gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, uh... My wife, I took her out on a date, and she wanted to see A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, I found it very disappointing. Even for a children's movie, it was very, uh, it did not have much depth to it. Uh, which, you know, even Disney's children's stuff these days, you were pointing out earlier, carries, like, some nuance, and this was just very, yeah, I told my wife it was like if they made Oprah a movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just that, uh, 
let's just talk about these positive aspects of things. It's positivity, positivity. What would your wife think? The same. I think she actually disliked it more than I did. Oh, really? She's more critical of movies than I am. I, I, I'm a terrible movie critic. Like, if, if you're someone that's really critical of movies, don't get my opinion. Because I'm usually like, yeah, it was all right. I had fun. <laughs> You're like you're like Andy Bernard in that episode of The Office where they're watching that Jack Black movie and he's like, I can't be a movie critic. It's too hard. I can be a food critic. This quiche is bad. <laughs> I'm not quite that bad. There are movies where I'm like, that was garbage. This movie, it wasn't garbage, but... I, it, here's the thing with, with you. I've been friends with you for years. And I think this is part of what happens with you sometimes. Like... You spend your money on something, mm-hmm. and so in your mind, you have to justify, like, I made a good purchase with this. And so even if it was not the greatest, you're you're going to find some aspect of it to to make it good. Yeah. Because you just don't want to feel like you wasted 15 bucks going to a movie. <sighs> that might There might be some truth to that. I know you, man. You, you, it's hard to hard for you to part with your cash. Understandably so. But especially uh, the movies, especially at the movies, because that is one of those like you can go in. Uh, what is up, X Rob Wolf? Welcome to the stream, Rob Wolf. Um, but yeah, definitely, because uh, I and I have to do that too. I'm like, is this something I like because I spent money on it, or is it something that I like because I actually liked it? Which is why everybody who's like. Well, getting a review copy makes you biased about it. It's like, I think it actually helps me. <laughs> yeah. Because it's frees you, yeah, it frees you from the expectations. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Sorry. I'm, so, Wrinkle in Time, and speaking of me not being very critical of things, uh, I watched Iron Fist the second time with my wife because she was watching it. And I, I actually enjoyed Iron Fist. But I don't think, I think, I think that's an area where I didn't spend any money on Iron Fist. But my expectations were tempered. Like, I didn't know anything about Iron Fist, but I knew it was Kung Fu. And in my mind, Kung Fu is always, like, real... Cheesy. Yes. Yeah. And so I didn't expect Iron Fist to be anything less than a cheesy Kung Fu show. And I thoroughly enjoyed every second of it. So X, uh, so Rob Wolf wants to know what, uh, what topic we're talking about. Right now we're just talking about what we've been uh, what we've been playing this week. So And watching. And You joined us right on the front end of the show. Great time to be alive. Yeah. And then the last thing is Overwatch League. I've gotten way into that. Thanks to you. I'm very glad you pushed me into this. Uh, this week, I finally settled. The, I was debating between rooting for the Valiant and the Gladiators. And when the Gladiators beat the Spitfire, I was like, all right, I'm sold. <laughs> I will root for I you still haven't now. gone back and rewatched it. Uh, it. Let's not get too in the weeds about it. But d- did you watch the whole thing? No. I, oh, okay. I, uh, see, I don't watch Spitfire games because I just expect everyone to get rolled and it's going to be boring. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I actually got back from our date. That was Saturday, wasn't it? And uh, we, uh, when we were getting out of the car, I pulled up the Overwatch League app just to see how the game was going. And I saw, like, I, I, look, I read it, like, three times. I was like, Gladiators 2, London Spitfire 0, 2, Glad- what, what, what? Gladiators, wife, I have to go watch this game. <laughs> I went, I oh, so you watched the second half. half. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that, uh, that third round, like, it was good. Uh, and Fisher has just made such a difference as a tank for, for the Gladiators. So it was good. Uh, Rob Wolf wants to know what we think about Guitar Hero Live. Uh, I bought it way back in the day, it, like when it first came out, played it for a little bit. I just uh, I couldn't get into the, uh, the new format of the guitar. I thought they were trying something new, and that was cool for the genre because it needed it, but it just didn't, didn't stick well with me, so... I never tried it. Uh, is that all you've been consuming? Yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I'll i talk about what I've watched, and then I'll talk about what i played. So um, I watched two superhero movies this week, Larry. Mm-hmm. I watched Wonder Woman, Uh huh. which is about a woman who of can... Wonder. Of wonder. Of great wonder. <laughs> uh, it was fine. Is a good word. It wasn't the landmark superhero movie of the decade? No. No. And here, here's some of the issues that I had with it. First of all, I thought it was incredibly slow. Yeah. Story-wise, like, I thought the Amazon, like, where they were actually in, I don't, I'm going to caveat this with, I don't know anything about Wonder Woman source material, like, never read the comics or anything. So, like, pretty much all my knowledge is based on the little bit I encountered it, like in cartoon or television form, the Super Friends, yeah, or so, uh, like all that that stuff, like the the precursor exposition stuff was fine, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I thought uh, when they started showing the power of the Amazon women, like that was really cool. Like uh, when the Germans uh, started trying to hunt down Chris Pine, that was cool. But it lasted entirely too long with like uh, Wonder Woman as a kid. Mm-hmm. It, it took forever. And then I understood what the movie was trying to do with the whole like, it's this woman from another world who doesn't necessarily understand how the real world works, but maybe she does on this like higher plane than everybody else, which ends up being the way that it was. Spoiler alerts for Wonder Woman because it's been out forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> I really thought like uh, they overplayed that whole like, well, she's just kind of an ignorant foreign woman who is from a far off land and doesn't understand how war works or whatever. And uh, when you know the direction it's going, and I think that's kind of the the place that superhero movies constantly fall in is like you know the direction, you know the rhythm of this thing. Um, but then uh, he says, "What about the ending?" I mean, the the fight was okay. Yeah, like. I I like superhero movies that take place in the context of war because it makes, like... (coughs) Sorry, I've been sick all week. Uh, It makes, like, the cataclysmic levels of damage that are going on, like, a little more acceptable. Yeah. In my mind. So, the setting and all that was was fine. But uh, I just thought they could have done something a lot more interesting with the story. And yeah. and one of the things I really get frustrated by in any kind of movie like this is where one of the lead characters has had his eyes open to something that he never understood before, but yet he continues to doubt that other things that he didn't know before could exist. So like Chris Pine stumbles upon this world of like these amazing women who have never seen a man in their life and they have all these crazy warrior abilities, but yet it's really hard for him to wrap his mind around like, Ares is the god of war and maybe controlling all this stuff. Like, as soon as he gets back to his real world stuff, he all of a sudden forgets about all this amazing, crazy stuff that he saw before. Yeah. Like, that as a story device really rubs me the wrong way. Go ahead. Uh, so, I, I was, so, I enjoyed Wonder Woman. I thought it was good. And, and I think that it got maybe more credit than it deserved because, as a DC movie, it was excellent. Mm-hmm. But, see, that's the issue. Uh, it shares the same issues the other DC movies share, but to a lesser degree, it's just very slow. And I don't know, did, I know Zack Snyder didn't direct it, but did he have anything to do with the screenplay or anything? Do you know? I, I think, because didn't he, he like had something to do with, with it in like the pre-production stages, and then I think like relieved himself of duty because he thought that it would be better for a, a, a female to direct it, because it had okay. a female director. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think that he's terrible. I know that everyone <laughs> loves Zack Snyder. I think he's awful. Uh, 300's the only movie he's ever done that I found even a little bit enjoyable. Every DC movie has just dragged on and on. And if you get the Zack Snyder cut, it's a three-hour movie. That could be an hour and a half movie. Yeah. Uh, it, I don't know. I hate it. I think DC would be in a much better place if they would have banked on literally anybody else. Yeah. I also don't like the whole, like... Here's a group of ragamuffins who are actually amazing at what they're they, they're supposed to be doing. Like it just had all those kind of superhero tropes that I guess you come to expect. But DC <coughs> movies, and I think Marvel gets into this sometimes too. Like they take themselves so seriously mm-hmm. to the point where these things that are kind of like fantastical and a little tropey just stick out like a sore thumb within it. Yeah. And like Marvel really learned that lesson with Thor. As you pointed out, I haven't seen Thor Ragnarok, yeah. but like the, the the first Thor movie was so serious, like, and then Ragnarok comes around and they started leaning into the humor because it's like this is this is ridiculous, and you have to make the world around it a little ridiculous in order for it to all kind of blend together. You know, uh, we do a lot of photoshopping for images, like for our business, and one of the hardest things to do is to take a separate image, place it into another image and make it look like it all belongs. And like, I feel like that's kind of what happens in any superhero movie that tries to take itself way too seriously. Like Mm -hmm. here are these things that are logical fallacies that would be okay if they were surrounded by a world of logical fallacies. But when everything else seems kind of realistic and you're taking it really serious, it's really hard to overlook it. And that's what I felt with, with Wonder Woman. Yeah. Moving on to the... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, more to say about Wonder Woman. Because Rob Wolf, in regards to the ending, he says, I think they overdid it a bit. 
I was watching this movie with my brother-in-law, and he said, oh, okay. At the end, he goes, oh, okay, so it's Dragon Ball Z now. <laughs> and I thought that was a great comparison. Yeah. Because it suffered from something that... Because that causes issues down the road that never get addressed. It's the same syndrome that Dragon Ball Z suffers from, and a similar anime, Bleach, suffers from. So in Bleach, I don't know enough about Dragon Ball Z to make the comparison accurately. So I'm going to use Bleach as the example. The whole thing is there's this guy, he's a Shinigami, a Soul Reaper, uh, Death God, who fights off these evil hollows that eat people's souls and try to kill people, blah, blah, blah. He does this in the spirit realm. Well, as the show goes on, he gets more powerful, more powerful, until you get, like, the Super Saiyan type thing where he can he can go Bankai, which is this next level of power, and then he can do Vizard with this mask, it, like, this whole level of power. And then you have the situation of, well, why doesn't he from now on just put the mask on as soon as the fight starts? Yeah. <laughs> so, Wonder Woman, canonically now, we have that she can just float through the air just, like, raining down destruction without touching anything. Why do we not start from that point in yeah. the Justice League? <laughs> right. In fact, we never get to that point in the Justice League. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to invalidate all my opinions by saying the second superhero movie that I watched was Power Rangers. Which is about Rangers of power. Of power. Of great power. Loved it. <laughs> I loved I texted you. Hold on. I'm about to pull up our text message conversation and read. Also, thank you for the follow, Rob Wolf. Uh, Rob Wolf. So, I'm going to pull up this text that I sent you yesterday. Uh, I said, so, I watched Power Rangers and Wonder Woman this week. I can safely say I enjoyed Power Rangers much more. Now, going back to everything that I said about Wonder Woman, all of the same things are wrong with Power Rangers, right? <laughs> the story's a little slow, like, you... It, it's the problem. We went and watched. Was it all of us that went and watched Godzilla in theaters together? I have never seen any Godzilla movies. Okay, uh, it was the one with like Brian Cranston in the beginning or whatever. But it's like I think me and Seth may may have went and watched it. It took no joke an hour for Godzilla to show up on screen, and it's like the movie is named Godzilla. I remember it. there was a controversy. It was like 18 minutes total of Godzilla screen time. Yes. Godzilla. I'm like, the movie is named Godzilla. Why are you acting? Why are you focusing so much on the mystery in the characters' minds of what this monster is going to be? You are ultimately writing your story for the audience who knows the answer to the mystery. <laughs> like, this isn't interesting. Power Rangers has the same exact thing. Like, it takes them an hour and a half to finally be able to morph. And it's like, it's morphing time is what Power Rangers is about. But... That being said, I thought they approached all of those weaknesses in superhero stories, especially superhero origin stories, with an awareness of the issues. And they, now, albeit for me, Power Rangers had a lot more nostalgia to lean into and whatever, like, and so that kind of carried it a little more for me because I was much more into Power Rangers than I was uh, Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought the humor was really good. I thought... I thought the way that they kind of address like all of these issues that high schoolers are going through, like they did it in a in a fairly nuanced way. Like they weren't like super <coughs> out in front with it, except for like the I'm on the spectrum, but he's on the spectrum, and that's how he communicates. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it it was really just a, a story about five teens with their own sets of struggles and issues. That, and I thought the most interesting was with Kimberly, like. She probably had the... Uh, what she did was awful in the movie. And for those of you who haven't seen it, spoiler alert, she sent a naked picture of another girl to a bunch of people in school. Mm -hmm. That was the big secret she was hiding. Like, at the end of the day, her struggle was nowhere near the struggle of, like, the guy who's taking care of his dying mom mm -hmm. or the girl who's moved to different schools every year and, like, has no idea how to connect with her parents because of lifestyle choices she's making or whatever. Like... But I thought that was interesting, too, that it was like it wasn't the biggest secret that was the biggest secret. And I think for, like, teenagers especially, you have a tendency to think that the thing that you're going through is, like, the biggest thing in the world, when in reality, in comparison to others, is probably not. But I enjoyed all of that. Like, I liked that aspect. It was, it was like the, a sci-fi breakfast club. That's what I said when I saw it many months ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm talking about all this, and you, you, you've already seen it, like, a long time ago, so I don't know how much you recall or remember but uh i just i thought they they knew it was going to be kitschy they knew it was going to be like this kind of cheesy lame nostalgia play but i thought they did it in a really cool and respectful way like mm -hmm. so uh mad brog 
once they got into the Zords, it became goofy, he says. It did, like the dialogue especially, like you're driving, you're piloting these giant robots to fight this giant golden monster and you're just cracking jokes back and forth. And then the whole plot point of like, oh, we're going to get dropped into this pit and then we're going to become the Megazord. I do like when the kid was like, it's a Mama Zord. Wait, no, that sounds lame. A Megazord. <laughs> but uh, Power Rangers back in the day, it was about like the one-liners and the stupid Which humor. were ten times worse. Oh, than yeah. Right uh, but I agree with you, uh, the, what you said earlier uh, to me about the putties being like the biggest awful thing. So disappointing, the putties. Because they're just big golems, like big rock monsters. And it, it was impossible for that to look good in the fight scenes. <laughs> the whole martial arts component just died when the putties came into play. But that was another one that they were like, we're going to destroy millions of dollars worth of property <laughs> and then act like we saved the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole like, it's hidden under a crispy cream. Like that was that was super funny to me. Like I just thought it it was good. Like and it was aware of itself and and that to me played a lot better than Wonder Woman's like oh this is all serious lore that we're playing yeah. into. Like not a lot of humor in it. So the Power Rangers movie got grittier than it was. Uh, oh yeah. And that was actually something I struggled with whether I was okay with or not because the the heroes were not inherently heroic. Most of them were kind of not good people yeah. <laughs> who had to learn how to be better people. Yeah. Whereas you go watch the original series, it's like we picked like these really morally upstanding youths or yeah. whatever. Uh, that being said, I think some people expected it to go much greedier than it was. Like for some reason, we didn't process that this is is at its heart still a children's movie. Like yeah. we're not gonna have the Power Rangers lobbing people's heads off with a sword my mom is trying to facetime me or whatever the android equivalent is and i don't know how to mute it so that's okay uh anyway <laughs> um so we we expected more grit out of it than we were going to get and I, I think i don't know i went in expecting it to be a little bit goofy a little bit silly and in fact it was my daughter uh i don't think she was even three yet uh, and i took her to see this it was her first movie i, I got her a pink ranger zip up hoodie with the helmet hood thing going on and wore my green ranger shirt it was it was fantastic i had a blast with my kid uh but this was not joseph khan's power rangers uh black rangers struggling with a drug addiction and red ranger got his head shot off (laughs) yeah i like how they made rita repulsa the the green ranger and like the fallen green ranger i thought that was really cool and i i thought i thought the casting choices across the board it took me half the movie to realize who the actor playing jason was but that was Doc Ray Montgomery, Billy from Stranger Things season two. Oh, yeah. I was like, this dude's face looks so familiar. And then when they showed it with just like with this helmet on, where it was just showing his face, I was like, that's it. But uh, I thought the casting was good all around. Brian Cranston was a, it was a little like hard to overcome the uh, uh, just the fact that it's Brian Cranston. Yeah, you know, like which to everybody, he's like the guy from Breaking Bad. To me, he's Malcolm's dad. <laughs> So, uh, the Green Ranger thing, I, did you watch like after the credits they teased Tommy Oliver? No. Okay. So they set up for the sequel, but I'm real sad because I don't think it's going to happen because the movie didn't do very good. But I wish but uh, somebody I out there dump a, dump a jump truck of money up to that studio and make that sequel happen for me, please. Wait, you're not talking about the scene where he's holding the camera. No, no, no. Okay. no. They uh, had a cameo. Yeah, they had a cameo. But after the credits, there's a... Uh, there's a new student who comes in named Tommy Oliver. And that's oh, okay. The Green Ranger. Okay. I, I fast forwarded to look for. Uh, at, was it one of those like mid credit scenes? It might have been. Okay, that's probably why I fast forwarded through the credits to get to the end. All right, let's move on to games because that's what this podcast is about. Is it though? Because that's true. consistently we're starting. To, well, this week isn't so bad. We're like twenty four minutes. Well, so. I, I, so I played two games. I'm going to be real quick about this. I, I, okay. I started to play Mario Odyssey. Okay. And uh, it's just awesome. It's so fun, like, the, the the unique mechanic of throwing your hat onto different things to control it, and I like how, the, so, there's these pipes you can go into that will turn the world 2D for different stages for you to get to different places on the map. I th- thought that's, like, a cool little throwback to, to old school Mario games, so, uh, but it's definitely, like, a, I, I'm going to pick this up, play it for 15 to 30 minutes, and... I can put it down, you know, like yeah. I, it's not a huge time investment, but something to just chip away at near autom uh, near automata. I still don't know how to say it, but I purchased <laughs> it because it was on sale for $30 uh, this week. And 
That game is awesome. I so, don't know anything about this game. So basically it is a it's an RPG. You play as this um you're like a cyborg character or Maybe just a full-on robot. I don't know what the difference is. I'm so, like, I'm versed on all sci-fi. A cyborg is partially human. Okay, no. This is just a robot that, okay. like, has has some <coughs> level of consciousness about it. Uh, but uh, you're a warrior. Earth has been destroyed. You've moved to, uh, like, bases around the moon. And you're trying to win back Earth from the invaders and blah, blah, blah. But what makes it so cool is it is, like, kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different styles of games so 75 percent of the game is third person rpg like you're walking around the combat super fast and fluid and fun uh but then sometimes it'll go into like these top down sort of like galaga shooters Mm -hmm. uh so like in the space combat there's other times where it'll turn into like a 2d hack and slash sort of game uh and i just i really appreciate the the pacing of the game the, the rhythm of the game that it's constantly giving you like something new to encounter. Now, I'm not very far into the story or anything like that, but that game was up for all kinds of awards, especially, like, sound design and soundtrack, and it's totally deserved because the music in the game is freaking awesome. So uh, I'll probably talk more about it the more more I play it, but for right now, I'm loving it. But uh, let's move on. You've also been playing a crap ton of Overwatch. Crap ton of Overwatch, but we're getting good. We are getting good. I got, uh, I got, I'm so into it that I'm using the Xbox looking for group feature to find randoms with microphones to play with after you guys get off. So, uh, yeah, I'm really into it. All right, let's move on, Larry. Okay. To the releases of the week. Releases of the week. <coughs> All right. Uh, two remasters to talk about. The Devil May Cry HD collection is coming out this week on Xbox One and PS4. And the Burnout Paradise remaster is coming out on uh, PS4 and Xbox One. You you a Devil May Cry fan? I never played it. Uh, never something that really appealed to me either. But if you uh, are interested in it, you're going to be able to play three of them. Uh, Mad Brock wants to know how far I've gotten into Monster Hunter. I'm still chipping away at it and playing it, I, I, but I'm only like Monster. I'm only like Hunter rank nine or something like that. So, but that's another one. Like I know I can get in. Most missions are an hour, and I can like do a mission and then just step away from it. So. Uh, all right, Larry. So, yeah, Devil May Cry and Burnout Paradise. Those are your two releases of the week. Um, not gaming related, but just so you know, Star Wars The Last Jedi releases this week on Blu-ray. So, In Larry's opinion, the greatest movie ever made other than yes, that's Casablanca. Definitely what I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry. Let's move on to topics. Yeah, we've got some topics for you. I'm going to kick this over to you. All right, so uh, my topic is not news and the fact that it's not news is in fact what makes it newsworthy <laughs> so uh this article comes from forbes and it's loading so i'll tell you who wrote it when it's done loading oh yeah forbes is like oh man you can't block the pop-ups there we go all right uh the article is called this destiny despair cycle feels different than all the others and it is written by paul tassie and uh I'm actually not going to read this article to you. You can go check it out. Yeah, it's like a feature-length article. So. But more or less, the point that he's making is that Destiny has seen some rough times before. There were plenty of missteps in the first game. There were missteps at the launch of the second game. But, you know, there was always, like, Destiny would mess up and they'd fix it. They'd mess up and they'd fix it. But with, but with the second game, what has happened is it's just one mess up after another and then the way they address that issue usually doesn't resolve the issue and often introduces new issues into the equation. And so you've had these times where people were pretty negative on Destiny, and but this time it seems different. Uh, and you know, we've gotten to the point where we don't talk about Destiny anymore, which is huge because even when Destiny is messing up, that's newsworthy and we talk about it. But we've gone several months now, like, not bothering. There for a while, it was almost, you could count on, we were going to have a weekly, <laughs> well, we joked about making a weekly feature, what did Destiny do wrong this week? Well, in a little editorial, it, 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 the reason we don't is because they all follow the same rhythm of, like, here's the issue, oh, we're aware, we're working on it, we're looking into it, and then the next week, it, it literally is the same conversation over and over again, and it's really just uninteresting to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
But that's where you hit the problem. When your game is no longer interesting to even talk about when it when it's wrong. Yeah. Apathy is is much worse than than hatred of something. Yeah. And so uh, I don't know if he goes quite this far, but you know, just thinking about this, I'm to the point where I feel like Destiny is dying a quiet death, and I I don't think the ship's actually gonna get righted. And I'm even if like they totally take a step back and just start working on the third game. I I don't. I don't think they're. I think Destiny is done. It's, it's a little weird because you know you have the you have the saying like you fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But when they fool you in two different ways is is the issue. Like and so, the problems with the first game were really just kind of a lack of content in in the mm-hmm. beginning. But when you dug down into the systems, like the game was actually pretty deep. I think they tried to make this one so much more accessible and approachable that they lost a lot of the heart. And also, it seemed like such a polished thing coming out of the gate. But then you realize, like, progression happened so fast. And there were people that once the raid came out, you were done with almost everything after, like, a week. Yeah. Uh, So, I agree. Like, I think it is an issue where uh, it's kind of a – he calls it a death by a thousand cuts in in the article. And I think that's true. Like, you have all these little issues that come up. Uh, and when you're constantly having to put out fires on the little issues, it makes it hard to uh, tackle the bigger problem with Destiny, which is that I don't feel like Destiny 2 had the heart of the original Destiny. Uh, I don't think the multiplayer was enga- was as engaging. Even though the, the raids and a lot of the PvE stuff was kind of designed with a lot of the same <coughs> mechanics and, uh, you know, it, it was a very similar feel and approach. It, there just didn't seem to be as much of it or that it was as meaningful because your light level really only mattered in like PVE. It didn't matter once you got to uh, like PVP stuff like it used to. Um, but I also think one of the other things Destiny suffers from is the fact that there are so many other options like it. Yeah. Whereas with Destiny 1, it was kind of like, this is unique. This is what we're jumping into. Like, uh, if you want to get into something like this, that's going to be a grind, and it's something you can play with your friends over hundreds and hundreds of hours. This is what you have, but now you've got all kinds of stuff like that, and that problem isn't going to go away. It's only going to get bigger. Like uh, you can go play. I mean, Monster Hunter is very similar, not not in the sense of like the the PvP side of it, but PVE. Like there's hundreds of hours worth of stuff to do with your friends on that game. Uh, you know, The Division, and we're going to talk about that here in a second, uh, but like Anthem's gotten announced, and that's going to be another game that's very similar to it. But then, even outside of the genre, you have other games like like an Overwatch or like a Rainbow Six Siege that are these living ecosystems that are asking for tens, uh, tens if not hundreds of hours of your time uh, to jump into. And it's almost just a problem of the time available yeah. for Destiny. And, like, if you're not going to create something interesting, and if it's always going to feel like it's something that's being tweaked and worked on, not in the way of, like, well, there's always something to be fixed, but in the sense that, well, there always seems to be a problem. Like, yeah. that's the difference. Uh, if something always feels broken, you don't want to you don't want to use that thing when there's other things that do it better. Yeah. And uh, even the, the DLC <laughs> was so light on content that I want to, like... So I was somebody that actually, I enjoyed how accessible they made this game because the first game was just too much for me. Uh, but for every one of me you picked up, you lost probably three of the deeper players. Yeah. But even for me who enjoyed the accessibility, when I saw what the DLC was, I was like, I'm not dropping 30 bucks for this. Yeah. This is nothing. <laughs> yeah. When you've got a game like Rainbow Six Siege, which is getting better all the time. You've got an Overwatch, which is getting better all the time. You've got Ghost Recon Wildlands, which is improving, like... All these games are growing and getting better. Why am I going to dump my hours into this game that just isn't giving me any return? Yeah. Uh, and I really hate this because... So, the moment where I got like crazy obsessively into gaming was when Bungie dropped that first Halo game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I hate to see Bungie in the position they're in. I, I feel like at this point they're just going to have to roll on to a totally new product pro- project. And I hope that's the route they go because... I, I don't know that there's any saving Destiny. <laughs> it's also almost a psychological thing because they nuke Destiny 1 so hard. Like, it's... 
the progression, of course, like you're not bringing your guns, you're not bringing your armor, you're not bringing any of this stuff over into the, the second game with you, which when they announced it, we even talked on the podcast, like that makes sense. You know, you're, yeah. you're doing this reset. But then you look into the PvP stuff and it's like, well, the light level doesn't really matter when you're playing. Everything's balanced out, even down. It's like, well, then what the heck did it matter? Yeah. If you weren't coming in with, with this equipment or whatever. Um, and so it's almost like one of those, well, why would I sink this much time into this game if they're just going to nuke it again and start over on Destiny 3? Like, yeah. how, how few issues would it have needed for them to have been like, okay, this is a good product that we're going to continue on for that 10-year vision like Destiny was originally, mm-hmm. which we kind of laughed at when they said that because it was like, well, we don't <laughs> see that being possible with anything. But now I think we are seeing like, yeah, I don't know if there is another Rainbow Six game in uh, in development right now because they're so, you know, they've dug in on Rainbow Six Siege. Like, there isn't an Overwatch 2 in development right now because... They're still building this product of Overwatch after going into year four or whatever. So, uh, what's up? You good? Sorry. <laughs> you keep talking. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, but yeah. So that whole de- that that whole idea of like Destiny is a ten year game. I don't think I saw it when they first said it. But now that I've seen other other companies do it successfully, or at least they're on the path to do it successfully, it's like. Why couldn't they have just stuck with that? Yeah. Why couldn't Destiny 2 have just been another really big expansion that came with another, what was it What was it called, the little coin that you got? Yeah, I know. That leveled about. you up to, light lo- to level 25 or whatever, so you can immediately yeah. start doing end game level stuff. Like, why couldn't they have just done that? Why'd they have to nuke the entire thing and make the most hardcore fans feel like, well, that was a waste? There's one aspect of that that I think wasn't necessarily their fault that may have totally changed the course of all this. If Destiny 1, if they had not had to develop it for both the Xbox One and the previous generation, you know what I'm saying, PS4 yeah. and PS3, like not, not next gen and previous gen, I think that 10-year vision actually would have been possible. Yeah. But uh, whoever made the call to, to put that limitation on them, to, to have them have to make a game that could run on the old consoles, that, was, that really killed that 10-year vision, I think. But it would have been awesome, and I really they might have done better if they'd gone that route. So Mad Brock says, I feel some of the problem with Destiny is the game of service model they are trying. I would love for you to uh, expand on that, because I, I can definitely see it, because their whole idea is like, in order for you to stay in this living ecosystem, you're constantly having to drop 30 bucks, not constantly, but you get what I'm saying, like a couple times a year, you're dropping 30 bucks on an expansion to stay in it, and yeah, that model works for like a World of Warcraft or something like that, where, uh, but for, on a console side of things, that isn't how it works. Like, yeah, uh, Overwatch, <coughs> Overwatch lives its entire life on its loot box system. You know, like mm-hmm. uh, all of the the future development, uh, the like support development for it is paid for by loot boxes, and I guess game sales too. But and now the Overwatch League, you can. You can do what we've always wanted to do on the loot box side of things and just shell out money for the coins to buy the specific skin you want. Yeah. So now they're like hitting it from both sides. Yeah. So uh, I do think that I agree that Destiny's Destiny didn't build anything in Destiny One to really build off of, and they showed that by saying, "Well, we're not even going to talk about the darkness in Destiny Two. This yeah. thing that was like such a huge mystery and." Uh, this impending struggle and doom that was coming, like, well, we're just going to scrap that. Just like with Destiny 1, where they had this expansive story and universe, and then they got, you know, uh, what, like a year out from development, and they were like, oh, never mind, we're going to nuke that. Like, there was no direction as far as the narrative goes, and that's something Mad Brock brought up. Look at how good Halo was as a story in a game. Uh, and he's, what he's saying is, like, Destiny doesn't have that. Yeah, you know, like we were all expecting it because your favorite Halo games were the Bungie Halo games, and you expected that same level of storytelling and care for the characters in the universe. As I mean, Halo is deeper than the what five games that they developed, four games. Uh, well, I mean, if you're counting all the games, Wars and ODST and all that, I think you got like eight, S- nine games. Yeah. So. so yeah, and then you've got a book series. You've got one of those. 
anime mashup movie things. You've got a live action movie. You've got a live action series. Yeah. There's a lot of lore. There's a lot of stories to be told in that universe for sure. And that stuff existed in a like really inaccessible way with Destiny, but it wasn't delivered in a way that made it appeal to a wide uh, the the wide range of gamers playing your game. Like yeah. you didn't you didn't get them and then if they would have gotten attached to their character, you nuked them going into Destiny 2 anyway. So, uh, I don't know if... But, all that being said, I don't know if I agree with you that it can't write the ship. Because they've got the Activision money for marketing and, and development. Uh, they, had, they had the name recognition. Uh, but it is going to have to be something big to, to write the ship. And I think... Uh, another thing is I, I think that this conversation is the problem we can't quite put our finger on what it is where with Destiny 1 going into uh, not Rise of Iron The Taken King mm-hmm. you had a list and you knew like this 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 if you fix this this and this we'll be cool and they did that I don't think they have that list with Destiny 2 yeah uh, so it makes it a lot harder uh, anything else Larry? that's all I got <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to my topic, which is the Nintendo Direct that was last week. So I'm just going to give you a basic rundown of everything that was announced, okay? Okay. Do it very, very quickly, and then we can just talk about what we want to talk about. There's only one thing to talk about as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) So they kicked it off with the 3DS. uh, uh, WarioWare Gold, uh, there are 300 micro games to enjoy. It's coming uh, August 3rd. Uh, Dylan's Dead Heat Breakers is coming May 24th with a demo uh, May 10th. Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story uh, is uh, you'll switch between Bowser and Mario and Luigi in an action RPG. Uh, it's going to launch in 2019. Detective Pikachu is coming uh, March 23rd alongside a Detective Pikachu Amiibo. And then a Luigi's Mansion 3DS port uh, will launch in 2018. You have to imagine this is them sending the 3DS off for a Viking funeral. <laughs> but uh, some stuff I know that Nintendo fans are excited about. Yeah. All right, moving on to uh, their real console, the Switch. Uh, Kirby Star Allies uh, is coming, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, so I'm trying to look at what... I'm sorry, I didn't read this part. Whoops. Uh, anyway, we'll just move on. Kirby Star Allies. <laughs> There's going to be some char- new characters coming, whatever. Okami <laughs> HD... <laughs> Okami HD is releasing uh, summer of 2018. Octopath Traveler, which used to be Project Octopath Traveler, and they just kept the, the demo name. That's coming July 13th. Uh, right. Travis Strikes Again, No More Heroes. Uh, each game has a boss at the end. You can play co-op with the Joy-Con partner with the infamous Bad Man. That's all the details we have there. Uh, Dark Souls Remastered uh, is coming with an Amiibo on May 25th. Mario Tennis Aces is coming June 22nd. You ever play any of the Mario Tennis games, Larry? Uh, no, they never really appealed to me. They're pretty fun. Okay. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, which was a Wii U game, uh, is coming uh, July 13th. Undertale is coming, but it has no release date. It'll just come when it's ready. Uh, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy is releasing on July 10th. I'm so excited about that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Little Nightmares Complete Edition is coming May 18th. Fra- uh, South Park The Fractured But Whole is coming uh, April 24th with the first two DLCs, and the third DLC will be uh, available at a later date. Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition, another Wii U game, coming uh, May 18th. Platoon 2, version 3.0, is coming late April. It's going to include a bunch of different stuff. It releases, uh, uh, wait, this says coming late April, and then says releases summer 2018 for 20 bucks. Okay. All right. There's more Splatoon coming, all right? So for all of you squid kids out there. Springish, summerish. And then finally, uh, Super Smash Bros. Nintendo Switch uh, is coming sometime in 2018. Inklings are confirmed to be a part of it. Larry. Yes. Go ahead. I am so excited about Super Smash Bros. I love that game so freaking much. And I told you from the moment the Switch launched, as soon as they announced that Smash Bros. game, I'm going to find a way to buy a Switch. So, I've got very little time to find a way to buy a Switch. Yep. Uh, Or steal one. 
You know, I hadn't even considered. But now that we have, <laughs> let me turn this hat around, cut a couple eye holes in it, and we are good to go. <laughs> they will never know. We've been robbed by a Wookiee. Um, I'm not as big a Smash Brothers fan as you are. I'm much more into like Mario Kart or, uh, you know, Mario Odyssey. Uh, and it shows when we play Mario Kart because you destroy me every time. And you will destroy me in, su- in Super Smash. I can't wait so, for this playing field to finally be level. <laughs> so it appears as though this is going to be a new Smash Brothers as much as a Smash Brothers can be new. Uh, but it's not just a port of the Wii U version. But uh, you have to imagine a lot of the same characters, a lot of the same arenas, and all that's going to come with Squid Kids. Hope maybe with uh, Crash Bandicoot in it as well. That would be yeah. awesome. Like, if uh, they can pull in some of these, like, is there a main character in uh, Dark Souls? <laughs> pull that guy in. The guy they're making an amiibo after, I can't remember his name, but yeah. So uh, it, they, they have a larger pool to pull from all the time, and the more third party support they get, uh, I imagine there's going to be more people there. But. Uh, yeah, people lost their minds about this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but, do you have anything else to say about Smash? I mean, we don't really know anything about it. Yeah, so. that's the thing. Like, but I don't need to know anything about it. I'm going to love this game. I went on YouTube and I see all these like 45 minute videos breaking down the trailer. <laughs> the only thing that I, the only thing that came from it that I love is the idea that the Smash universe is just the Nintendo characters held that they all get sent to. to fight. <laughs> <laughs> because they turn around and like there's the big burning emblem behind them and after the world goes dark and it's like yeah this is it after you die you can go to the <laughs> smash world to fight for eternity uh but i'm like how do you get 45 minutes of video content out of this 30 second trailer that shows like next to nothing yeah uh you, you know the actual premise of smash brothers is it's the toys that the hand is playing with oh okay no i didn't know that so that's why you fight the master hand at the end like oh, that's okay. the person playing with the toys I always thought that was really interesting. Like, it kind of throws you back. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I had all these toys from all these different genres. And, of course, the thing that I made them do most was fight. Like, Batman's not only going to fight Superman, but he's also going to fight my Street Shark. And And my party. (laughs) Yeah, I had Barbies too, Luke. You are totally normal. (laughs) Um, No, I did the same thing. I would take a shoebox, and I would jam a pencil in each corner, and then I'll put rubber bands around it to make my own wrestling ring. Nice. And then I'll have them wrestle each other in a battle royale. So, yeah. I don't know. It's cool. But that, that hell theory is pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I do want to say this, though, Larry. Yes. Nintendo Direct stopped the world. Mm-hmm. The entire video game universe stops in its tracks to watch a Nintendo Direct. Every single time, especially in the Switch world. Smash Brothers saved this direct, yeah. In a lot of ways, like, look, uh, I don't want to take anything away from any of the announcements. I think they're all cool. Uh, it, Octopath Traveler is going to be its own IP, its own Switch exclusive game. Like that, that's something to get excited about too. Mario Tennis, obviously, but I can't help but wonder, like, if Sony stopped the world. Yeah. To announce a bunch of previous generation games being ported over or games that have already been on Xbox One coming over to PS4 or whatever. How much could they get away with doing that, you know? Yeah. And part of it is not even on Nintendo because Nintendo fans just lose their mind with... And they go wild with wild speculation. Wild speculation. About what's going to come. And they set themselves up for this gigantic level of disappointment. And uh, it's just, the Smash, the Smash announcement makes all this worth it, right? But yeah. you have to imagine if that last minute is cut out of that direct, I'd be sitting here talking a different, a totally different ball game with you, you know? Yeah. Um, I didn't watch the direct, but just following, like, keeping up with Twitter that day and what was trending, like, I didn't even click on any of the trending things until I saw the word Smash Bros and lost my mind. So, right. yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. So, uh, but outside of the uh, outside of the Smash announcement, what what other things do you when you get your Switch? What are some other other things that maybe were announced here that you would uh, consider? Dark Souls interests me a little bit. Um, the, uh, see, beyond that, nothing for me really. Uh, 
there are things already that I'm interested in. I'm interested in being able to take Skyrim on the go. I'm, I'm interested in having Mario Kart. But Smash is really the only thing out of this list that... Well, no, sorry. I'm also excited about Crash. Yeah. But again, that's, you know, I've played Crash before. I'm just excited for the nostalgia to play it again. <laughs> Solaire of Estroa. Esotra. That is, uh, that's the oh. name. Uh, so, anyway, uh, out of this, Mario Tennis is something that I think I'll, I'll, I'll pick up and play. Yeah. Uh, but only in as much as I like want to play people at the office in it or whatever. Um, I don't want to play Dark Souls on my Switch because it's such a raging game. I don't want to have. I just want to have my sixty dollars controller in my hand and not, you know, my three hundred dollars console uh, yeah. in my hand. I'm just, I'm not a I'm not a controller thrower, but uh, then I, I uh, used to be until I broke my favorite controller. I had this sweet red controller on the three sixty. And, man, I remember exactly what happened. I was playing Left 4 Dead. And there's this character called the Charger. So it's this big zombie with one little tiny arm and one giant arm. And his job is to run through the pack of characters and just snatch one up and carry it away. <laughs> and there was lag that day. And I charged somebody and, like, hit the person. And it acted like I hit a wall instead. And I chucked that controller across the room. And I just shattered it, dude. <laughs> I was so <laughs> mad at myself. <laughs> um, Never again. I'm excited about South Park. I think uh, I'm going to... I have it for PS4. I think I'm just going to wait, buy it on my Switch, and play it on Switch, because that's a, that's a game that's easy to just probably take on the go if you play a few minutes at a time. Yeah, that's actually why I didn't buy the Skyrim remaster number 342 on the <laughs> Xbox One, was because I knew that was a game that I wanted to be able to have on the go when I finally did get around to getting yeah. the Switch. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, that, that that's pretty much it. I'm not super excited about Crash or anything like that on it. I'll probably try out Octopath Traveler just because uh, it seems interesting. But uh, but no, the, the Smash Brothers uh, announcement definitely uh, definitely took the day there. So, all right, Larry, let's move on. Okay. To the news. News with the podcast guys. <coughs> <sighs> Sorry for all the coughing. Unacceptable. Uh, I have unsubscribed from this podcast. <laughs> First item on the list, Fortnite is coming to uh, mobile. Interesting. This is from our boy Eddie over at GameSpot. It says, Fortnite Battle Royale is coming to mobile devices, Epic has announced. Most intriguingly, this is apparently the same 100-player experience that will support cross-play for some systems. Thanks to a partnership with Sony, the game will support cross-play and cross-progression between PS4, PC, Mac, iOS, and eventually Android. The Xbox One edition uh, does not support cross-play, presumably due to Epic's partnership. Uh, and then I think that they finally, they came out later and said that the Xbox One does support cross-play. They just didn't want to confuse it that it would be cross-play with PS4, which it will not be. Yeah. Uh, quote, same gameplay, same map, same content, same weekly updates, end quote, Epic said on a forum post about Fortnite Battle Royale's mobile edition. Quote, we believe this is the future of games, the same game on all platforms, console quality, graphics, and action. Play when you want, where you want, end quote. Larry. Yes. Thoughts on this? I'm not shocked that they did that. Like, I'm a little surprised that it did it. That... Okay, let me, I messed that all up. <laughs> I'm not shocked, but I am surprised. I'm surprised they did the game on mobile. But I'm not shocked like the dude in the article who's like, surprisingly, it's the same 100-person gameplay. Because there's a game called Rules of, of Survival, which is another PUBG knockoff, already on mobile, that is the same kind of experience. So, I don't know. That's already out there. So I'm not surprised that they're actually able to do it, I guess. Um, but, I mean, this is cool. I, I'm just, I don't like Fortnite even a quarter as much as I like PUBG. One yeah. of my youth group kids, I mentioned playing Overwatch, and one of my youth group kids is like, what, you don't play Fortnite? And I said, no, because I'm not a boy. I'm a grown man, and I play PUBG. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fighting words, man. you got to watch out, man. I don't care. <laughs> um, I I was shocked by the crossplay. Yeah, that, that's not surprising. So the controls for Fortnite are already super clunky on console anyway. Which like, is why I hate it. Between the building and the, the shooting and like all of it, it's just so much to keep up with and all like limited to the buttons on your controller, not having a keyboard to, you know, uh, bind stuff to. Um, I can't imagine what it's even going to be like playing this game on mobile. I'm, I'm sure it can be done. Uh, uh, absolutely, it can be done. It's being done. But I can't imagine the experience being 
even remotely enjoyable, especially when you, you're going to be on your mobile device where you literally have to do touchscreen everything against people who are playing on PC with a, with a whole keyboard and mouse. Like, yeah, I just can't imagine that being fun. Now, I, I, I guess they're going to have to make, like, there'll probably be different rules, like, hey, you jump on to cross-play servers. I don't think it's necessarily going to be open across the board, like, you're automatically tossed onto it, like, say, a Rocket League or something like that. Oh, hey, Milky. oh Milky is in the in the stream. Welcome, my friend. Uh, but, and then I imagine there's probably going to be different rules of engagement. I, I'm not exactly sure what that could look like, but you have to level that playing field somehow. I, I actually think that uh, the, the combat is going to be the harder thing to deal with with the mobile controls. I could see the building actually being easier because instead of navigating the menus with buttons, you can just tap whatever you need in the menu. Yeah. So... Maybe it'll balance itself out. The better builders will be on mobile and the better killers will be on console. <laughs> Possibly. I, I, P, PC. I do like the idea of the cross-progression, though. Um, it, it gives people a reason, even if it's not necessarily the most enjoyable place to play, to stay in your ecosystem, like sign into your Epic account. Everything that you do on the go is going to be able to uh, you know, be done, uh, is going to carry over to your console or your PC version. So I think that's really cool. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. It makes sense to do it. Yeah. You have to imagine the next step is Switch. Uh, if it can run on, a, if it can run on a phone, it can run on Switch. I imagine. So yeah. get that game over there, and then if you can do cross-platform play on that with cross, you know, platform progression, then heck, that may even be something that pulls me into it. Like uh, just because a a five on a, on PS4 becomes an eight on switch for me because it's just it's such a cooler platform to play on for me but uh so uh so yeah be looking for that soon i think you can sign up to be a part of like the the testing that launches in a, a few weeks or whatever uh next item on the list larry all right all right the next call of duty is going to be call of duty black ops i i i i i i i call of duty black ops 4 this is from chris Pereira over at GameSpot. this is following a great deal of speculation and apparent confirmation uh, the 2018's Call of Duty entry would be a new Black Ops game. Activision has made an official Call of Duty Black Ops 4 is in development and will be released later this year, though it will be out sooner than we're accustomed to. Black Ops 4 is headed to PS4, Xbox One, and PC. There's no word on a Switch version, as some had hoped. It will be released on, brace yourself, Larry, Friday, October 12th. Very strange release date for Call of Duty. True. Almost a full month sooner than the early release window that, the new, that new Call of Duty games typically occupy. As previously confirmed, this year's game is being developed by Treyarch, the studio responsible for the entire Black Ops series. Larry. Yes? They are running for the hills from Red Dead Redemption 2. Everybody in the world. Everyone ought to. <laughs> and it's... Dude, this is a really surprising move to me. Like... I think it says something. It, look, Call of Duty, for all of the negative press that it gets, for all of the thumbs down on YouTube videos that it gets, <laughs> uh, it is still consistently the best selling game every year. Uh, every year. Every year that every year that GTA doesn't come out. So for them to be aware of like, oh crap, Rockstar game is coming. We need to back off of this thing. I don't... It, it, to me, it, like... That blows my mind a little bit. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, I agree with that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm never excited about a Call of Duty game. I'm just not into them very much. But, yeah. Uh, right. You don't want to release near Red Dead. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Milky says, uh, first of all, he says, whoa, what is with the mountain man get up? Furry hat, thick scruffy beard. I know you guys are in Virginia, but oh, wow. Uh, okay. Well, you see, I love this hat. And anytime it snows, even a little, even if it's not that cold out, I wear it. Because it feels like I've got a beard all around my face. And isn't that the dream? You can't really tell. Well, that <laughs> when your beard connects to your hair. That's like having a beard all around your face. Yeah, but my hair isn't as scruffy and warm and cuddly as my beard. That's true. You can't tell where the where the hat ends and the beard begins. This is a very similar shade to my beard. Um, but then he says, Cod always releases on time every time in November. That is really saying something. And it is. You know, Call of Duty is like 
first week of November, second week of November, somewhere around there. Uh, Friday release over the last few years, but uh, I would be I will be interested to see where next year's Call of Duty releases after this because I think what we are seeing is that uh, games are uh, all stu- all studios and publishers are kind of playing around with where they release during the year and. Can Call of Duty start to get a little bit more? Because right now, I think what's happening with those November release dates is a lot. When I worked at GameStop, this was a conversation I had with a lot of people. Like, well, I'm not going to buy that now because I know in two weeks, Black Friday, it's going to be on sale for half price or whatever, or 20 bucks less. Like, and so I, I wonder if this is going to have a positive effect for Call of Duty outside of just getting away from Red Dead Redemption Two, in the sense that it's like, well. Now you're gonna to have to wait six or seven weeks before the Black Friday deals start rolling in. Yeah, um, that'd be smart. <clears throat> Quote of the day: Feels like I have a beard all around my face. That was from Milky. Uh, Living the dream. Next item on the list, Larry. Ubisoft officially announces the Division Two, and I don't really need to say much more about the news itself because that's it. <laughs> <laughs> they released a little bit of like a like a teaser, but they said that more information is going to be coming in E3 2018 uh, for the full reveal. Uh, but they also outlined some of the updates they're doing to uh, the original uh, division. So my question to you, Larry, is we just talked about Destiny and all of the issues that they've run into. I only played the division for about a month and then fell out of it. You played the beta and that's it. Yeah. And it wasn't that I disliked the game even. I just, I had a lot of other things going on at the time, so I didn't get it. But how do you think that The Division and Ubisoft can avoid some of the same mistakes that The, that the Division uh, has made, uh, that Destiny has made, I'm sorry. Uh, that's phrased a little different than you wrote down. Oh, I'm sorry, what did I write down? Oh, yeah, what would you like to see change? So I'm going to answer both questions. Okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so one, to avoid the same mistakes Bungie made... I think they need to pay attention to what worked and keep it. Uh, Don't sacrifice your core audience for the sake of picking up some random people. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's great to appeal to new people that aren't into the game yet, but if you do it at the expense of your fan base, it's going to cost you. Right. I think that's a lesson they need to learn from from Destiny. But what would I change? There's one thing I would change about The Division. I think what I experienced in the beta was great. What I've been watching from the outside as they developed it further and improved the game has been great. Uh... I need to be able to play with more than three people. <laughs> yeah. That's that's all I need from The Division. And in fact, if that had been a possibility, I might have bought it. You, Ben, and Seth all bought it. And any game I get, me and my wife are going to have to play together. I said that way I don't want to. I love playing with uh, My wife is going to want to play uh, games with me and spend time with me and talk to me. wants to kill people with me. Oh, living the dream. It's awful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, there was never going to be a situation where I could hop on The Division with... More than one of you at a time, probably. And that's not fun. So I had there been a game type where I could have played with more, I, pro- I might have wound up buying it. Yeah. So give, give me give me some options in the Division 2. You can roll with more than three people at a time and things. We've been doing it for decades now in gaming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, as far as changes, I, this is a game, and I've said this since we started playing PUBG, I want to see this game have a battle royale mode, like mm-hmm. because I think pu- what PUBG needs is like a third person cover based system where you can like where you can attach to cover or whatever, in like a Gears of War or like the Division. They've halfway put a cover based system in, but they yeah. didn't quite finish it. <laughs> so for me, that's definitely like a big thing is a, a battle royale mode, and I. Uh, I, I don't remember if I detailed how I would want to see it play out, but like where you're fighting over your loot and you're looting people, uh, it, just like in a regular battle royale, but then the winner gets to leave with whatever loot he takes out. Yeah. Uh, and I think that would be so cool because not only are you just looking for guns to kill people with, but maybe you're looking for a specific gun that you want in your loadout that's exclusive to the battle royale mode that you have to get by having a squad win or whatever. Uh, I think that would be really, really cool. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I want to see that. Um, and then, as far as other changes, I agree with you. A, a bigger party size would, would definitely be great. Um, but as far as avoiding what Destiny ha- has done, I think absolutely what you said. Don't make people's time with the Division completely irrelevant. 
mm-hmm. by just saying like, "Hey, we're going to give you this shader like <laughs> that shows that you played the game." Uh, really give them an ability to carry their character over into this new world. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, don't try to do a full reset. Um, in fact, I played the beta. Like my main goal, I don't. Do you remember my main goal in the beta? What I was trying to do? You were trying to be the police officer in the dark zone. Oh yeah, that was fun too. <laughs> I was after this hat. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> how fitting. <laughs> um, let's see what what's Milky have to say. He says the division Ghost Recon and Rainbow Six are the annual releases for Ubisoft, very much like EA's Battlefield, Battlefront, Medal of Honor. All the majors are trying to compete with the COD annual release to keep name rec- recognition up front. Uh, the Division now has a 4v4 Battle Royale-like mode. Uh, they say the writing on the wall, so I expect to see that expanded. That's my wild speculation of the day. I do need to nitpick a little bit with what Milky said here. Because the Division and Ghost Recon and Rainbow Six are not annual games. In fact, the Division is going to just celebrate its two-year anniversary. You have to imagine it's going to get to year three before, or, or get to its third anniversary before we see the Division 2. Rainbow Six came out two years ago, and Ghost Recon came out last year. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I don't think it's necessarily as much about name recognition as Ubisoft to show and throw For Honor in there as well. Like, they're really committed to this games-as-a-service idea of we are going to create a solid foundation that then we will continue to build on throughout throughout the life of it, rather than constantly fixing little problems, which they do. They they put out hot fixes and, and small patches. But uh, we're also going to continually add content. We're going to continually listen to feedback and not just push it out in little bursts, but we're going to put out huge content updates and say, we heard you on this, 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 and this. Starting next week, all of that's going to be live. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a major thing with Destiny is the communication is so poor between the company and the fans. And it's a lot of just like, oh, a little fire over here, pat it out. A little fire over here, pat it out, rather than just like, how do we just get all the flammable crap out of here yeah. and keep the fire from, from even, even popping up? So, uh, so yeah, I, I think the Division 2 is something that I'm going to be into. I like the first Division, but it was just one of those, like, it was a weird time as far as, like, who I was playing games with. And, and it just, it didn't work out where we were all on at the same time to be able to do it. Then you didn't end up getting it, and so... We just and then Overwatch came out like two months later, oh, so they went in my life. Yeah, it was a completely, <laughs> uh, completely different. Uh, it was just completely different circumstances. So, uh, next item on the list, Larry. State of Decay Two finally has a release date. This is uh, on IGN, uh, the IGN first. Uh, it says uh, the release date is May twenty second, and it's going to cost twenty nine ninety nine for the base version of the game. Larry, did you watch the gameplay? I did not. I'm sorry. Oh no, Larry, you're gonna love this game. Somehow I missed that there was gameplay. <laughs> it's a, if you click on the article, it's the big video that starts playing. <laughs> I always ignore the because a lot of, so a lot of the news sites like the video is them basically reading the article. Yeah, and I'm the t- I'm the person that I would rather read something than watch it. Yeah. So this sh- our show doesn't appeal at all. To me. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I just skip the videos out of habit. That's my bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they had a 25 minute gameplay video of the co-op, uh, and it's just, the first state of decay was everything you want in a zombie game absent from co-op. Now it's everything you want in a zombie game with co-op. Is, Which is my game. I'm it, all about that. It's all about relationship management, resource management, like, uh, there's permadeath in it. Like when your character gets low on health, it's like, Hey, remember if you let this person die, you don't get them back. <laughs> uh, so you're building community, like. It looks really awesome, and I and at a base price of thirty dollars, this is like no brainer. I'm probably just gonna go ahead and do something I never do. Probably just pre order, <laughs> get it out of the way because I know I want to play it. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Sony has made Neil Druckmann the vice president of Naughty Dog. This comes alongside some other uh, restructuring. This is from Chris Pereira at Gamespot. It says. Change is afoot at Uncharted and The Last of Us developer Naughty Dog, though it all appears to be positive news. Naughty Dog has announced new roles for several individuals at the company, including new co-directors for the upcoming Last of Us Part 2. 
In a post on Naughty Dog's website, President Evan Wells shared news that was announced during a recent in-house meeting. Neil Druckmann, who played key roles in the development of the first two Uncharted games and served as the creative director on both The Last of Us and Uncharted 4, has been promoted to vice president. Quote, in recognition of his expanded role contributing on critical studio-level decisions, Neil Druckmann is now vice president of Naughty Dog. He's been a vital part of the management team for, for some time now, and we're proud to formally acknowledge his involvement. End quote. Uh, so despite the lofty new title, Druckmann will still serve as The Last of Us 2's creative director. So working two jobs, he he better have gotten a giant pay raise for that. Uh, meanwhile, its game directors have been named as Anthony Newman and Kurt uh, Marginot, uh, both of whom were lead designers on Uncharted 4 and worked on The Last of Us. So... Just cool news, Druckmann is, every interview I've ever watched with him, like, just seems like a chill dude, and that studio is where it is because of his efforts. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it's also cool to see that, like, he's not going to move to some corner office and then just kind of, like, get served updates from the Last of Us team, that he's still going to be involved in just as big a capacity. So, so that's really awesome. Uh, then... Let's see, last item on the list, and this is one of those like, oh yeah, we, we knew uh, this was going to happen. Uh, Sony's Days Gone has officially been pushed to 2019. Uh, and I put something here that actually belonged in the State of Decay 2. What? Uh, State of Decay is not going to have microtransactions, so uh, just mention that real quick. But yeah, did anybody think Days Gone was coming this year? I did not. When it wasn't in that sizzle reel of like, hey, the, the, here's the stuff that's coming out in the first half of 2018, I just, I knew. And plus, like, you don't want to release Days Gone in the fall. I think it's going to be an okay game, but when you've got to compete with Call of Duty, when you got to compete with Red Dead Redemption 2, we still don't know what Bethesda is going to pull out for the fall or anything like that. Just run for the hills. February worked great for you with Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, let's, let's just put another game there. Pl plug and play. Yep. All right, Larry, let's move on to everybody's favorite segment. The random question of the week that I didn't give you before the show. It's true. I'm terrified. I'm not prepared. Larry, I want to talk about your bad gaming habits. Oh, okay. I don't have any. What are, <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. What are your worst gaming habits? You talked about some of your, uh, your prior rage uh, <laughs> while playing games. Uh do you have any other bad habits? Uh, so, bad habits, in, like, any kind of bad habit. Any kind of bad habit when it comes to games. Do you just eat bags of fingernails while you're playing games? Uh, like, yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay, so, rage has definitely been a classic Larry issue in gaming. I feel like I've gotten that pretty well under control, but, you know, when we first uh, started gaming together, uh, I'd fly off the handle Pretty bad if I felt like I was disrespected. <laughs> Case in point, the first time oh, okay. we played Halo with Seth, you were going for an assassination, right? You had, you had gone into the animation. Uh, yes. He shoots a rocket in, correct? No, no, no. No, no, no. It was what pretty egregious. Oh, okay, go ahead. You tell the story. I was in a tunnel. You were there. I was in a tunnel assassinating a guy, and Seth... Rides in on a ghost and speed boosts up into the tunnel and sliders <laughs> both of us to get the kill that I was already in the process of getting. <laughs> Milky says, feel the rage of God's gunslinger. <laughs> Milky, uh, once we're done, I will send you a message telling you what I think. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> you will feel the wrath. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this happens. Larry flies off the handle. <laughs> Because, look, there is nothing, I think, more egregious in Halo than stealing a kill when it's an assassination. We are of the mind that you don't steal kill, kills in Halo because it's a team-based game. <laughs> but an assassination is a totally different ballgame. Particularly if you kill the person who's performing the assassination <laughs> to get the kill. But Larry had no idea that this was Seth or, like, one of my friends, no, right? No, I did not. So, I some did I dude. text you? I think I texted you. Uh, by the time I received the text, it was far too late. <laughs> it was far too late. <laughs> Luckily, that bridge did not remain burned. Uh, but Larry also got mad at me 
when we were, uh, and, I, and we've told this story on the podcast, uh, oh, yeah. the teabag, because I teabagged him playing Halo 3 uh, the first night that I was in college, uh, and Larry got really, really upset with me and hated me for a very long time because of it. Yep, so. yep. Uh, and, and so what I do if someone betrays me or something like what Seth did is I spend the rest <laughs> of the match just hunting them down and killing them in ways that the other team gets credit and I don't get booted. <laughs> He's really good. He's scarily, it's scarily good at it. I, I excel at helping the other team kill you without me getting credit for killing you. It's stupid. It's bad. <laughs> Melky says that his comment about your title is uh, is a payback for you telling his Google Home to post shirtless photos of John Stamos. <laughs> uh, I don't understand. You're offending me when I gave you a gift. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so okay, yeah. Uh, but you've you've since overcome your rage yeah, for the for, most part. For the most part. Now, I, now I mute my mic before I yell all the horrible things I think about the person who's done done me wrong. Right. And that's a step up. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> I don't break controllers anymore. I, I'm getting better on that front. Uh, but. The the only like really terrible ha- habit I have as far as gaming goes outside of that I think is uh, just not having a lot of self control with the time that I spend gaming. Uh, again, something I've pretty well got under control, but I can still fall into that trap of if I'm really enjoying it, I will I will go and go and go to an unhealthy degree. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, rage was never really like a big thing for me. Uh, and, and you've played games with me long enough that my mindset is generally just like, this is a game. Yeah. There's nothing to get super upset about. Like, at the end of the day, it's just a game. That's changing a little with Overwatch. And get a little more ragey with Overwatch. There are times where you get mad, but the way you react is, I'm done. It's not fun anymore. I'm getting off. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is a perfectly acceptable way. Like, yeah. to me, that's that's my best way of dealing with it. Yes. Yeah. I, that's fine. It's much better than I'm going to make everyone around me yeah. suffer too. I don't want an extra hour, of, and it's it's selfish because I don't want an extra hour of what I'm feeling right now to sour what I can experience from this game later on, which is mm-hmm. something that I fell into with Overwatch the first time. Yeah. Uh, but what I used to do, I used to just troll people hard, and I probably still would if uh, it wasn't like so party chat oriented. But like, so one of the things I love to do when I hop into a uh, like a Call of Duty uh, Modern Warfare 2 server or whatever, is just start pretending like I was everybody's <laughs> boss. Just be like, all right, guys, we're rolling in. Everybody is rolling pistols, all right? I don't want to see any assault rifles. I'm looking at you, and then I would mispronounce whoever's gamer tag I was going after. So I would call you, like, Ninja Skew Roll. And then you wouldn't ima- you can't believe how upset people get, man. Like, mispronouncing just names. mispronouncing their names. So, uh, I do a lot less of that now. but And I think it's mostly because the people are in parties. Because it can be funny from time to time. Mm-hmm. Especially when there's some guy that's like... I think I would only do it now if somebody was being a jerk to me originally. Uh, but I would... I would I could get in and silence uh, an internet bully pretty quickly with the way that I'll joke him, but I don't do that uh, much anymore. I think my biggest bad habit now is just having too much to play at one time, and like I don't have a ton of time to game like in the middle of the week when I'm having to go to, go to work an hour and fifteen minutes away, like. But uh, um, I like right now I'm playing Monster Hunter. I'm playing. Overwatch. I'm playing PUBG. I'm playing Mario Odyssey. I'm playing Near uh, Near Automata. Like playing these five games. There's probably more. <laughs> Who knows? There's probably more. Uh, and just and then I'll buy more and like have them in a backlog. Uh, I have a bad habit of like when I would buy physical games, I would buy it and it would just sit in the shrink wrap for you know months on end, and I would never get around to it. Like. <laughs> And Seth jokes me all the time for it, so that's something I want to get better at. But uh, I actually, I do that too, and may, I think maybe I do it for. The, there's something else that feeds into it for me. So for me, gaming has evolved into this thing that's just very social. If there's an option to play a multiplayer game or play by myself, I'm going to choose multiplayer every time. I love playing with other people, uh, but there's still this part of me like I grew up playing all these story based games, and I really love a, a good story, and so. If a game has a good, appealing story, I will buy the game 
and I have I have several games that I, I bought and never played, and I don't trade any of my games in, so I've got all these games sitting on my shelf that I, I act like one day I'm going to go back and finish. And some of them I really might, but most of them I'm not ever going to get around to. Yeah. Because there's always going to be someone who's willing to play an online game with me. Yeah. Uh, and probably the, the, wor- the biggest example of this is, is Skyrim. Uh, and that's kind of why I'm excited to get on the Switch and be able to take it on the go. Because, uh, so with, with uh, Oblivion, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, or is that five? Yeah, for Oblivion. Uh, I basically 100% of that game. I did every side quest. Everything in that game there was to do, except I've got a few Dark Brotherhood missions I didn't finish. <laughs> but aside from that, I did literally everything. And I bought Skyrim. I never actually finished Skyrim's campaign. <laughs> Which, that that is where the transition happened. Between Oblivion and Skyrim, games got so social for me that I no longer have time for stories. Yeah. And I... <laughs> That's another problem I've got is just like maintaining that balance because I do like sitting down and just playing a game by myself, but it's really hard for me to say no to like, hey, let's hop on PUBG, let's hop on Overwatch. So a lot of times I'll like play a story driven <laughs> game in the begin like in the morning or whatever before I go to work, and then at night it frees me up to play more social stuff. But the Switch is also helping with that because I can carry. If it's a story-based game, I'd rather just carry it with me when I've got like my lunch break or whatever at work. I can pull it out. So and. We live in a time where you just have so much access to so much media. We're kind of just engorged on it. There's just too much available. And so I'm kind of in the process of trying to cut some stuff down. Like, uh, I don't want to watch every TV show that interests me. I want to, I'll give stuff a chance. And and if it's not the best of the best, I'm going to stop wasting my time with it. Uh, I'm not going to, I used to like, I love bad horror movies. I think that's a really enjoyable thing to watch is just the awful, the most awful sci-fi and horror movies. But I'm, I'm stopping that because although it's kind of funny and kind of fun to do, uh, at the end of the day, those don't add much value to my life and it's a big waste of time. So I'm not going to watch any more of those. And then with, uh, with, I'm trying to like cut back and get rid of different social networks and I'm probably going to wind up basically just using Twitter. Yeah. Because I just, I get sucked into too much. And... I would much prefer playing through a good gaming story to a lot of the things I just mentioned. But those things are a little more convenient, so those are the things I default to. Yeah. Yeah, it's easier to hop on and, like, read 10 Facebook posts or whatever than it is to play 30 minutes of a, of a story-driven yeah. game. So, uh, Milky, uh, I'm not going to read uh, his stuff verbatim here, but he <laughs> says, my bad gaming habit is using really blue language. And then he talks about uh, going on rants about, you know, stuff about the opposing player and then realizing that he still has his connects uh, mic turned on. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, and his wife and two kids walking in in the middle of his horrible rant. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta cut back on that, man. Can't, can't have the kids here. And so, um, all right, Larry. <laughs> Hi, Salty. Welcome to the street. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Larry, let's get out of here. All right. Who are you? I'm Larry. You can find me on Twitter at Lair Hunts Zombies, L-A-R-H-U-N-T-S Zombies. And I am Luke Croft. You can find me on Twitter at TK from Antioch. Tonight I'm going to be streaming some Overwatch. Hopefully we can get another six stack running. Come join us around 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time over here on twitch.tv slash player3podcast. If you're listening to this on podcast services, just follow us over there. You'll know when we're live playing probably Overwatch. Uh, but then uh, we are the Player 3 Podcast every Monday over here on twitch.tv slash player3podcast to bring you the weekly gaming news. Then on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube.com slash player3podcast. Thank you for tuning in we love you we are the player three podcast player three podcast p3p uh.